Shalom and blessings in the name of Jesus, Messiah and Light of the World. This is a short video on Admiral Byrd's flight log from February 19, 1947. 0600 hours, all preparations are complete for our flight northward towards the Arctic Circle and we are airborne with full fuel tanks at 0610 hours. 0620 hours, full fuel mixture on starboard engine seems too rich, adjustment made and Pratt Whitney engines are running smoothly. 0730 hours, radio check with base camp, all is well and radio reception is normal. 0740 hours, note slight oil leak in starboard engine, oil pressure indicator seems normal, however. 0800 hours, slight turbulence noted from easterly direction at an altitude of 23-21 feet, correction to 1700 feet. No further turbulence, but tailwind increases, slight adjustment in throttle controls, aircraft performing very well now. 0815 hours, radio check with base camp, situation normal. 0830 hours, turbulence encountered again, increase altitude to 2900 feet, smooth flight conditions again. 0910 hours, vast ice and snow below, note coloration of yellowish nature and disperse in a linear pattern altering course for better examination of this color, color pattern below, noting also reddish or purple color. They're seeing rainbow colored snow. Oh, 9, 10 hours, both magnetic and gyro compasses beginning to gyrate and wobble. We are unable to hold our heading by any instrumentation. Take bearing with sun compass, yet all seems well. Circle this area to full turns and return to assigned compass heading. Position check made again to base, camp, and relay information concerning rainbow colorations in the ice and snow below. The controls are seemingly slow to respond and have sluggish quality, but there's no indication of icing. In the distance is what appears to be mountains. That was still at 0915 hours. At 0949 hours, 29 minutes elapsed. Flight time from the first sighting of the mountains. It is no illusion. They are mountains and consisting of a small range that I have never seen before. 0955 hours, altitude change to 2950 feet, encountering strong turbulence again. 1,100 hours, we are crossing over the small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best as can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow to the port cider, great forest growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. 10.05 hours, I alter altitude to 1400 feet and execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or a type of knit grass. The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. That's because in heaven, um, God is the light of all. I mean, there is no need for a sun. The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another left turn and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible, yet there it is. 10.05 hours, decrease altitude to 1,000 feet, take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed, it is definitely a mammoth-like animal. Report this to base camp. 
10, 30 hours, encountering more rolling hills now. The external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Continuing on our heading now. Navigation instruments seem normal now. I am puzzled over their actions, attempting to contact base camp. Radio not functioning. 11.30 hours. Countryside below is more level and normal. So, um, an entire hour has passed with no radio contact. And he's just continuing northward. And at 11.30 in the morning, countryside below is more level and normal. Normal, if I may use that word because he knows it's supposed to be snow and ice beneath him and yet it's green rolling hills. Ahead we spot what seems to be a crystal city. That's right, brothers and sisters, a rainbow crystal city. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My goodness, off our port and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft. They are closing in rapidly alongside. They are disc shaped and have a radiant quality to them. They are close enough now to see the markings on them. It is a type of sun, a symbol of the sun. This is fantastic. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We are caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. 11.35 hours. Our radio crackles and a voice comes through in English with what perhaps is a slight Nordic accent. The message is, welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral. You are in good hands. 11.35 hours, I note the engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. Controls are useless. 11.40 hours, another radio message received. We begin the landing process now, and in moments the plane shudders slightly and begins a descent as though caught in some great unseen elevator. The downward motion is negligible, and we touch down with only a slight jolt. 11.45 hours. I am making a hasty entry into the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot toward our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a large shimmering crystal city pulsating with rainbow hues of color. I do not know what is going to happen now, but I see no weapons on those approaching. I hear now a voice ordering me by name to open the cargo door, and I comply. From this point, I write all the following events here from memory. It defies the imagination and would seem all but madness if it had not indeed happened. The radio man and I are taken from the aircraft, and we are received in a most cordial manner. We were then boarded on a small platform-like conveyance with no wheels. It moves us towards the glowing city uh, with great swiftness. As we approach, the crystal city seems to be made of crystal material. He keeps emphasizing it. I'm sure he's astonished. Soon we arrive at a large building that is a type I have never seen before. Made of crystal it would be, right? It appears to be right out of the design board of Frank Lloyd Wright, or perhaps more correctly, out of a Buck Riders setting, far into the future. We are given some type of warm beverage which tasted like nothing I have ever savored before. It's delicious. After about ten minutes, two of our wondrous appearing hosts come to our quarters and announce that I am to accompany them. I again comply. I leave my radio man behind and we walk a short distance and enter into what seems to be an elevator. We descend downward for some moments. The machine stops, the door lifts suddenly upward. We then proceed down a long hallway that is lit by rose-colored light that seems to be emanating from the very walls themselves. Again, in heaven, God is the light. There's no need for lights. Amen. One of the beings motions for us to stop before a great door. Over the door is an inscription that I cannot read. 
The great door slides noiselessly open and I am beckoned to enter. Then I began to see my surroundings. What greeted my eyes is the most beautiful sight of my entire existence. It is in fact too beautiful and wondrous to describe. It is exquisite and delicate. Can you imagine walking into an office and everything's made of crystal? Of course it would be exquisitely um, made and, and delicate, you know, in design. I, he says, I do not think there exists a human term that can describe in any detail with justice what I saw. My thoughts are interrupted in a cordial manner by a warm, rich voice of melodious quality. I bid you welcome to our domain, Admiral. I see a man with delicate features and with the etching of years upon his face. He is seated at a long table. He motions for me to sit down in one of the chairs. After I am seated, he places his fingertips together and smiles. He speaks softly again and conveys the following. We have let you enter here because you are of noble character and are well known, Admiral. Yes, the master replies with a smile. You are in the domain of the Ariani, the inner world of the earth. We shall not long delay your mission, and you will be safely escorted back and for a distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at that alarming time we sent our flying machines, the Flugelrads, to your surface world to investigate what your race had done. That is, of course, past history now, my dear Admiral, but I must continue on. You see, we have never interfered before in your race's wars, barbarity, but now we must, for you have learned to tamper with a certain power that is not for man, namely that of atomic energy. Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world, and yet they do not heed. Now you have been chosen to be witness here that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science is many thousands of years beyond your race, Admiral. I interrupted him. I said, but what does this have to do with me, sir? And the master's eyes seemed to penetrate deeply into my mind. And after studying me for a few minutes, he replied, your race has reached the point of no return, for there are those among you who would destroy your very world rather than relinquish their power as they know it. I nodded, and he continued, In 1945 and afterward, we tried to contact your race, but our efforts were met with hostility as our flugelrads were fired upon, yes, even pursued with malice and animosity by your fighter planes. So now I say to you, my son, there is a great storm gathering in your world, a black fury that will not spend itself for many years. There will be no answer in your arms. There will be no safety in your science. It may rage on until every flower of your culture is trampled and all human things are leveled in vast chaos. Your recent war is, he's referring to the Second World War, your recent war is only a prelude of what is yet to come for your race. We hear, we hear, see it more clearly with each hour. Do you say I'm mistaken? No, I answer. It happened once before. The Dark Ages came and they lasted more than 500 years. Yes, my son, replied the master. The Dark Ages that will come now for your race will cover the earth like a pall. We see at a great distance a new world stirring, seeking its lost and legendary treasures, and they will be here, my son, safe in our keeping. That is the holy treasures of Yahuwah. Amen. And when that time arrives, we shall come forward again to help. Perhaps by then you will have learned the futility of war and its strife. Oh, yes, there will be... No warmongers left in the new Jerusalem. Um, after that time, certain of your culture and science uh, will begin a new 
You, my son, are to, he's speaking of the new Jerusalem. You, my son, are to return to the surface world with this message. Our meeting seemed at an end. I stood for a moment as if in a dream, but yet I knew this was reality. And for some strange reason, I bowed slightly, either out of respect or humility, I do not know which. Now I was again aware that the two beautiful blonde-haired hosts who had brought me here were once more at my side. This way, Admiral, said one of them. I turned once more before leaving and looked back towards the master. Um, he never got the man's name, but I believe it's either Enoch or Elijah, one of the two witnesses. Amen. Because we know that the whole city of Enoch was taken up right before the flood and put in to Sakat or Tabernacle, a safe place. And so this crystal city, rainbow crystal city, certainly sounds like it. A gentle smile was etched on his delicate, ancient face. Farewell, my son, he spoke then, and he gestured with a lovely, slender hand a motion of peace. Quickly we walked back through the great door of the master's chamber and once again entered into the elevator as the door slid silently downward. We were once again going upward. One of the beautiful male hosts spoke. We must now make haste, Admiral, as the Master desires to, de to delay you no longer on your scheduled timetable, and you must return with his message to your race. I said nothing. All of this was almost beyond belief, and once again my thoughts were interrupted as we stopped. I entered the room and was again with my radio man. He had an anxious expression on his face. As I approached, I said, It's all right, Howie. It's all right. The two be beings motioned us towards the awaiting conveyance. We boarded and soon arrived back at our aircraft. The engines were idling and we boarded immediately. The whole atmosphere seemed charged now with a certain air of urgency. After the cargo door was closed, the aircraft was immediately lifted by that unseen force until we reached an altitude of 2,700 feet. Two of their disks these UFOs, we call them UFOs, two of their discs, these flugelrads, were alongside us for some distance, guiding us on our return way. I must state here the airspeed indicator registered no reading, yet we were moving along at a very rapid rate. O oh, to 15 hours, a radio message comes through. We are leaving you now, Admiral. Your controls are free. Continue on. We watch... For a moment, as the flugelrads disappeared into the pale blue sky, the aircraft suddenly felt as though caught in a sharp downdraft for a moment. We quickly recovered her control. We do not speak for some time. Each man had his own thoughts. O220 hours, we are again over vast areas of ice and snow, approximately 27 minutes from base camp. We radio them. They respond. We report all conditions normal. Normal. Normal, as if it ever could be again. Base camp expresses relief at our re-established contact. Oh, 300 hours. We land smoothly at base camp. I have a mission. I have a mission. I have a mission. March 11th, 1947. I have just attended a staff meeting at the Pentagon. I have stated fully my discovery and the message from the master. All is duly recorded. The president has been advised. I am now detained for six hours and 39 minutes, to be exact. I am interviewed by top security forces and a medical team. It was a terrible ordeal. I am placed under strict control via the national security provisions of the United States of America. I am ordered to remain silent in regard to all that I have learned on the behalf of humanity. Incredible, stupendous, and I am reminded that I'm a military man and I must obey orders. Then, on December 30th, 1956, which is a month and a half before he died on March 11th, 1957, he says, I must write this diary in secrecy and obscurity. It concerns my Arctic flight of the 19th day of February in the year of 1947. There comes a time when the rationality of men must fade into insignificance and one must accept the inevitability of truth. I am not at liberty to disclose the following documentation at this writing. Perhaps it shall never see the light of public scrutiny, but I must do my duty and record here for all to one day read. The last few years elapsed since 1947 have not been kind. They ruined his life. The government ruined his life. 
I now make my final entry into the singular diary. In closing, I must state that I have faithfully kept this matter secret as directed all these years. It has been completely against my values of moral right. Now I seem to sense the long night coming on, and this secret will not die with me. But as all truth shall, it will triumph, and so it shall. This can be the only hope for mankind. I have seen the truth, and it has quickened my spirit and has set me free. Amen. I have done my duty towards the monstrous military-industrial complex. Now the long night begins to approach. Just as the long night of the Arctic ends, the brilliant sunshine of the truth shall come again, and those who are of darkness shall fall in its light. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. For I have seen the land beyond the pole, the center of of the great unknown. And I have just a short bit of a song. Take a trip on a rocket ship, baby. bless you and keep you in the name of Jesus, Messiah of the world. Glory, hallelujah, amen.